So welcome everyone to today's session and Ask an Expert session on flexible packaging for CPG brands. I am joined by Jeff Jacobs, who is with EPAC, and they are one of the experts in CPG flexible packaging. Jeff, welcome. Great. Thank you for uh, for having me. Glad to be here. Happy to answer any questions that uh, anybody has. Uh, and Jordan, should I get started by giving a little bit of my background? Do you think that's the best way to kick things off? Yeah, I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself. I know you're a mentor to some CPG brands as well um, and kind of share that experience. And then we will kick off with a couple questions after that. Sounds great. Uh, well, I am Jeff Jacobs. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at EPAC Flexible Packaging. Uh, EPAC is a uh, all digital flexible packaging printer and converter. So we make uh, flexible packaging, things like potato chip bags, beef jerky bags, uh, the roll stock that uh, ultimately gets turned into uh, bar wrappers, things like that, uh, is what we do as a, a company. Uh, my background is in marketing, advertising, branding, uh, digital, uh, and uh, have worked in a lot of CPG and uh, in the packaging uh, space for uh, quite a while. For the majority of my career, I spent about 20 years uh, with advertising and branding agencies, and in that worked with companies like uh, Whole Foods, Pepsi, Frito, uh, Stacy's, uh, Groceries, a number of different grocery stores, CPG companies, uh, and everything from that to technology like Best Buy and Home Depot, um, Samsung, things like that. So that's a little bit about me, my background. Uh, currently with EPAC, I've been with EPAC for uh, over five years now. Uh, in that time, we've grown from about uh, three plants uh, to about 26 globally. Um, we are all over the world, uh, US, Canada, Europe, Asia, uh, Australia and Africa. So we've got a uh, number of plants all over the place and use those to serve customers globally. Uh, I'm also, like Jordan mentioned, a uh, mentor with, uh, with SKU. Uh, I do some uh, CPG investing um, and uh, with my mentoring and SKU, I, I think I'm the longest running mentor with about 15 tracks that I've now been uh, a part of. And in that, I work with uh, brands that are in the emerging brand space to help them with their strategy, uh, packaging, design, uh, everything that they need from um, what they they need from a logistics and uh, organizational perspective uh, to um, how they position themselves and uh, what their business methodologies and uh, best opportunities are for for growth in the CPG space. I love that. And Jeff, I know you've seen a lot of kind of good and bad around packaging. Um, and this topic can get really big. So I think one thing that, especially with your focus area, is really around kind of flexible packaging, which is also kind of part of an industry term. Um, can you explain a little bit what encompasses kind of flexible packaging, what types of formats? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think that uh, flexible is uh, one of the fastest growing, I think it may be the fastest growing area of packaging. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that have, have recognized the, the benefits of it, that uh, it, it's lighter weight uh, than something like a glass jar. Uh, there are sustainable properties for a number of the different uh, material options that are out there and are available. Um, and there's there's product benefits, uh, both in terms of the, the end user that's uh, actually consuming the product, uh, something that's portable that can throw in a backpack and uh, consume it later, uh, individually packaged. Uh, products is uh, is possible with a, uh, a flexible packaging that uh, doesn't really make sense in glass a lot of the time, um, and uh, and it adapts to a large number of categories. You see a lot of companies that uh, have moved from a rigid uh, or other format into flexible because they see the benefits. Things like uh, the sour cream uh, that has a squeezable format. So there's there's different areas that have benefits to. Um, the, the way that a consumer uses it, uh, like I said, with single serve, uh, there's benefits to that. Um, there's also the, uh, the e ecological benefits that uh, everyone has a, a bad idea about plastic and uh, not, not all plastic is good, but, but some plastic is good. 
Um, there are benefits to that. Um, some of the bioplastics that are coming out, there's, there's still uh, some ways to go, but the industry is definitely moving towards a, a better um, a way to move that. Um, one of the statistics that I really like that uh, the Flexible Packaging Association came out with is that it takes 26 truckloads to move uh, empty glass jars that, uh, that that same 26 truckloads of, of volume that would fit in those jars, you can fit in one truckload of flexible packaging. And so that's a pretty significant uh, carbon uh, footprint that's required for transporting empty products that is uh, less necessary when you're using uh, a product like flexible. And, and then even within flexible, there's a lot of different opportunities for um, material science to uh, adapt to your product. So if you've got a product that requires a high barrier layer, there's options for that. If you're looking for uh, the, the, the least amount of, of plastic use, there's options for that. If you have an acidic product, there's options for that. Um, hot fill, there's options for that. Microwavable, ovenable. There's a lot of different ways that you can go and um, make it work for whatever your product type is, which, which is one of the complexities of, of Flexible is understanding using the right product for the type of product that you're producing. So Jeff, I know a lot of times when people think Flexible, um, like bar wrappers, like for energy bar, protein bars comes to mind. Um, yep. Stand-up pouches are really big, even like flat yep. packs that like a lot of candies will come in for. What other types of form factors do you see um, companies using flexible for? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you named a lot of the big ones is that the stand up pouch, um, a lay flat, lay flat would be, um, one of the individual, I should have had some, uh, some samples around here, uh, that I could have shown, but, uh, um, uh, things like a single serving sachet for like a, a tea bag, uh, is, is another format, uh, coffee pouches. Um, so you may have something like a stand up, uh, a co coffee that may be in a stand up pouch, like you mentioned, but you may also see it in a, uh, four side seal, uh, quad seal type of, uh, application, uh, flat bottom, uh, is another, uh, application, uh, that, that's used for that. And, uh, and so by using those types of, uh, of options, you can get creative uh, and, and think outside of both what your industry standard is or kind of go along with what everyone else is. Uh, yeah, so I've even had customers talk about putting a t-shirt in, uh, in a flat bottom bag because they, they want to kind of be a little bit different or take on some of that uh, the vibe from a coffee bag and uh, apply it to their product. Awesome, love that. Um, one question I got in advance, um, that someone sent was asking about the sustainability of kind of single serve. You know, it was interesting because I think pre COVID there was a lot of talk around like moving to multi-serve packaging and, um, you know, multi-use and, you know, obviously with COVID things moved to like single serve. And so I think flexible is a big part of, of that. Um, but where do you see things kind of going now? I know you mentioned like the footprint just of the packaging itself is, is pretty small and it's lightweight. Um, but where do you think, see things going from a sustainability standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different different options of sustainability, and uh, I think that there's there's kind of a where we are now versus where we're going in the future. Uh, there, there's not the infrastructure here in the U.S. to be optimally where where personally I'd like to see it. But that said, there are options, and so um, my my personal favorite option is P PCR, the post consumer recycled uh, plastic that is used for creating uh, that type of uh, of product that has very similar uh, characteristics and properties. Things like uh, high barrier layers. If you've got a a product that uh, doesn't want to have a lot of oxygen passing through the uh, the, the barrier, there, um, it, it it gets that that. Uh, benefit of having a uh, recycled product that it's already happened and not being reliant on the customer to recycle it and put it into the, the, the recycling stream. One of the problems that we have in the U.S. is we just don't have the infrastructure in order to do that, to collect those products. Uh, and ultimately, that that is a chicken or the egg kind of problem for the recyclers, that they don't have enough waste stream of that product in order to do it. And so uh, they can't fire up their plants and spend millions of dollars to fire up a plant that's only going to operate for 10, 20 minutes a day. Um, and so then the customers are not sending it to the recyclers because they, they either know or, or 
or just aren't doing it because there's not a good collection uh, system. Um, but when you look at other countries like uh, the UK, uh, where we have uh, two plants that are operational over there, 80% of the product that we produce is a recyclable uh, material because they have that infrastructure in place. They have that collection system. They have the plants that are able to do something with it. And they are able to, in turn, recycle that material. And so th there's, there's definitely a, a chicken or egg problem that we have right now, but there's also solutions on what we can do. And so using some of the inherently uh, green aspects of it by uh, lighter weight, less uh, CO2 emissions in the transmission of the products. Um, our process is a digital process, so it uses less uh, materials in order to etch the plates and create the plates, the water and uh, all the chemicals that are used in that process uh, are not necessary with the digital process. Um, and, uh, and, and by utilizing uh, both the process and the appropriate materials and paired with the uh, of the footprint that uh, is more appropriate, uh, then you you get a, a combined benefit. And so, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's getting better. And so um, when you've got recyclable, compostable, PCR as a, a spectrum of options, there's, there's a lot that you can do uh, with that to, to improve what you're doing. And uh, as an industry, there's definitely a lot that, uh, that people are doing. And as a company at EPAC, uh, it's definitely something that we are very interested in. Uh, we're working very hard on, uh, developing and working with our partners to develop new, uh, product offerings that, uh, that meet that. Awesome. I love that. Um, so I want to open up to a couple of questions that have come in to me. Uh, Jared, are you able to come on and ask your question around packaging for the dairy space? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Jordan and Jeff. Uh, pleasure to e meet you and or Zoom meet you, I should call it. Um, yep. I work in the dairy industry. We uh, I work for the California Milk Advisory Board. We represent you know roughly eleven hundred family farms in the state of California. Uh, we're considering uh, or we're considered more of a marketing checkoff organization of how we're funded and it's a mandate. Um, but we do get involved in a lot of, uh, you know, innovation. We work with a bunch of different brands. Obviously, packaging is an innovation in itself. I'm curious, um, you know, kind of innovations in the packaging space. Obviously, I have a, a lens towards dairy products. Obviously, dairy products can range the gamut from fluid milk to ice cream, yogurts, butters, cheeses, um, et cetera. And I'm just curious kind of what you're seeing, you know, relevant in the dairy space and definitely innovations in packaging that, um, are relevant to dairy brands. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I mean the, the first thing that comes to mind is the sustainability piece of it, which I just touched on, is that there's a lot of um, innovation happening in in that space. Um, some of it's here now, some of it's still a few years out. Uh, but the other thing that that I think that uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of and, and hearing and talking to a lot of people about as far as innovation is uh, in terms of connected packaging. Um, and, and, and how do you make that physical to digital connection between products? Um, one of the, what our offering is, is called the Pack Connect. And what it is, is a unique QR code uh, that can be placed on any, any package. Um, what that allows you to do is have a unique individualized serialized uh, code and identity to that individual single package, which does things like um, analyze uh, your, your uh, totally blanking on the word right now, um, your logistics channels. Um, not the word I was thinking, but that's the, same. That's the idea. Um, and, and how you can uh, monitor uh, how things are moving, whether they're moving efficiently and effectively uh, through your distribution channels when they're getting to, uh, getting to here or there. Um, are, they, um, are they late? Are they... Um, are they, are they connected to uh, things like cold storage? Do you need to have da better data retention uh, policies? So if you're looking at uh, holding temps and, and dairy um, and you need to have a, a good record retention uh, in order to ensure that, uh, all right, this was checked on a regular basis, you could uh, scan the code on a pallet uh, and, uh, and associate a, a temperature check with that. Um, you can also do things like recalls. So um, if there's a recall that's uh, affecting a certain um, product or uh, stream of products, uh, whether it be some kind of sort of contamination uh, in your production that is not discovered till later, uh, things like 
unique serialized code can attribute that individual product to the time it was produced uh, on the factory floor. So if you have a, uh, a security incident, uh, the one I use is uh, comes from my brother-in-law who's in the, uh, the meatpacking industry where uh, they had a, uh, a plastic button on one of the, uh, the, the, the controls that uh, was above uh, pork production. The button fell off and fell into the uh, material they could go back and look at the security camera, see that this happened at uh, 3, 3.32 uh, p.m. And they knew that uh, that's when it happened. And uh, they had no real way to isolate that, uh, that batch of when that product came out. And so in the end, they had to recall millions of dollars worth of products uh, in order to uh, recall and, and and take back that uh, that ground up uh, piece of a, a rubber button that uh, that they suspect they, they weren't even quite sure that it, uh, it got ground up into the uh, into the product. Whereas if they had had a, a serialized code uh, on each of the packaging as it went out the door, they could uh, identify when that happened and isolate just what happened within that time period afterwards. And so it might have been a ten thousand dollar recall instead of a multi million dollar recall. And the digital uh, packaging kind of extends into some of the other areas with uh, things like um, uh, customer interaction, collecting email addresses, uh, recipes, uh, teaching them about your product or how to use your product. And uh, the consumer interaction uh, also allows things like uh, location mapping to identify that uh, this product was scanned at this time uh, in this location to see where your product is being uh, being utilized. So I kind of I'm rambled there a little. Along with that, right? Like, I think there's been a increased interest from like the industry side on the that connection between like physical pack packaging and digital information. I think like you mm -hmm. mentioned, that was a great example from a supply chain standpoint of, you know, tracing product that might need to be recalled. Have you seen an increase in like consumer adoption of some of those digital tools or scanning QR codes. Um, I'm just kind of curious on like if if we've seen an increase of that or or if it's kind of plateaued or like what the real potential could be. Yeah, I, I think honestly what what that comes down to is is what what value in it is there for the customer. And, and what's that call to action? Why do they care about scanning the code? If you're just telling them, hey, go uh, go buy another product, uh, come 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 to our website. Uh, most of the time they're not going to care. Um, if it's to buy another product, maybe if they can't get it in their local grocery store and they want to order it, if it's just to go to your website, you're going to get a very low redemption rate. Uh, if you're like uh, one of our customers who likes to give away Teslas uh, and you're scanning to enter a contest, that's a much higher adoption rate that you're going to get and uh, get someone to, to, to scan that code. If it's prominent in the uh, front of the package, you've got people that uh, want to uh, want what you're uh, what, what you're offering. So um, I, I would say that it is is definitely lower than I'd like it to be, but it is uh, becoming more um, uh, prominent in what people are doing. I think that one of the biggest uh, boosts to to the space uh, kind of came from uh, COVID and the scanning of menus that uh, people uh, learned that, uh, all right, uh, I, I got to do what with my phone? How do I take this out? How do I scan a QR code? Uh, way better than the days back when I worked with Best Buy and uh, we were trying to get people to scan stuff at the, at the shelf level and, uh, and, and to teach them, hey, if you want to see product reviews, uh, all you have to do is go here, click on this, download this app, and then register your name, then click on the code, and then you can get it. Uh, now it's just open your camera, shoot it, it takes you to where you want to go, and uh, the experience can be much more uh, geared towards the, the mobile user. And so um, we've definitely come a long way from where we were uh, 15 years ago. Um, there's still more that can be done, but there's so much potential and power in what can be done, especially when you add on that serialized component of it uh, to, to measure it down to the package level. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I think um, a lot of, especially emerging brands who are like, hear the idea of QR codes and they're like, okay, how can I add this onto my packaging, but don't have a, a good sense of what value consumers will find. And a lot yeah. of times you mentioned they'll send your website or maybe like a sign up page for maybe a small discount. Um, but probably from the consumer standpoint, especially for first time consumers, it might be like, 
monetary like like what what how can i get money or some like win a contest or something that is yeah well it's, it's, it's what's in it for me and yeah. so <laughs> i mean i think that sometimes that is that is money or winning a contest uh other times it's uh it, it, there, there's something else that's of value to them um that they care about all right is this something that i really want to uh learn about do i want to learn about the product is there something unique about my product uh if it's a if it's a dairy product uh, if it's a cheddar cheese uh, most people know what to do with the cheddar cheese and how to use it but if it's something that's a uh, uh, one that they haven't seen before then that's a uh, uh, that that's an opportunity to educate the customer and use that to to teach them what what do I do with this cheese that I've never never seen before. Yeah, I love that. Just as a quick aside, that just kind of gave me some ideas around uh, for our Joyful Co, my gifting company, uh, maybe doing a QR code that takes customers to videos of people who are like introducing them to who's boxing the products for them and the companies and the individual products that are inside and within there and providing something that's connecting them to the behind the scenes of the product and things like that. So anyway, just some ideas that came yeah. to mind. <laughs> oh, yeah. But <laughs> um, next question. So Lupe, do you want to come and ask your question around your gelato frozen pops? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yep. you can. All right. Thank you for having me here. Um, I have a gelato shop and we make, um, the gelato frozen pops there. They're embellished with, um, coconut. They're different. Uh, and there's a variety of them. I think they look, I, you know, it's, it's good to see what they look like. I think it appeals to the eye and that's what um, your customers usually, they come in and they'll identify, oh, the one with the chips and things like that. So currently I am using a, a clear self seal bag, which is those uh, cellophane bags. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. in your opinion, do they, do you think they look cheap? I mean, I'm not packaging like at stores or anything, but for hygiene, I put them in, um, in this in this wrap and um, hand it to the customer. So I'm also going to be doing um, the uh, uh, what do you call a trike? I, I'm going to use my trike to get out to to the neighborhoods, and the, mm -hmm. the uh, frozen pops will be also wrapped in the uh, clear bags. So I was just wondering, what is your take? Do they're good? They're 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 you know people rave about the gelato pops, so it's not any cheap stuff, and it's with good gelato. Um, that we make them. So do you think they look cheap? Do I make them look cheap? Does the, uh, the bag? You know, it, it, it's, it's hard to say without seeing it, but my initial impression is no, um, that, that, that it, it wouldn't. You're, you're making me hungry. I kind of want to try one now. Um, <laughs> with the uh, coconut and the, everything added to it. But, uh, I, you know, I, I think it depends on the, the place that you're at. And so if you're, if you're a retail, um, I, I would I would say well I mean obviously you have to have some uh, identification to it to, uh, you got into some of the FDA labeling requirements that uh, you have to label it since you're doing it at uh, at more of a retail and a direct retail um, I, I should uh, I should say it differently that it's a direct retail where you're the seller um, selling it from the tricycle selling it from the uh, shop um, to me that's more functional. Um, and so I'm less concerned about it when you go to retail. And if you do ever decide to expand and go into a grocery store, a grocery store retail, not self retail, um, then, then yeah, you definitely would want to, to do that. I, I would recommend that you have some sort of see-through to be able to see what's in the bag there. Um, but then you start getting into the, uh, all right, how does it, how does it ship? How does it go through? If you've got a coconut that's, that's uh, covering it, um, what happens after it's gone through the, uh, the supply chain process and it, uh, it starts to crunch off some of that coconut and starts to fall to the bottom? Um, is that something that's going to cause a uh, kind of a, a negative effect on how it looks and how it appears uh, for that consumer? Then you might want to do something like a, a, an opa opacity or an opaque uh, color strip at the top and the bottom, so anything that falls down is blocked by uh, by that. Um, but uh, you still get that ability to see through that middle piece of it, and so um, that's kind of the design piece of it, and kind of thinking about all the different phases and cycles of uh, the product going through um, as it gets to the customer. Um, but kind of getting back to your question, um, no, I, I don't, I don't see that there's a problem with that. If you've got it fully sealed, um, they're ordering it, they're seeing it there. 
Um, I think there is a, a hygienic uh, piece to it that, uh, that, that that actually enhances it. Um, I think that you could do a, a custom made bag and, and I think that would um, enhance it. Um, but, but I'm guessing based on uh, kind of how you're describing at the stage of the business that you're at right now, um, that it's not necessary to, uh, to, to go too far um, in, in order to, to go to the custom. Okay, well, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks for the question, Lupe. All right. Next, we have a question from Monique. I invite you to come up and ask your question to Jeff. Hey, guys. Jordan, thanks for hosting. And Jeff, great to meet you. You're clearly a wealth of knowledge in the space. Um, I So uh, I, I'm the owner of Tomato Bliss. We make heirloom tomato soups and sauces. Okay. We recently... Um, we're, we're pretty focused on food service and we recently developed a pouch for food service. So a mm -hmm. 64 ounce pouch. Um, our product is high acid and hot mm -hmm. fill and we use a vacuum seal. So yep. one of the innovations in our product is that it's a farm fresh soup, but it's shelf stable and ambient temp. So mm -hmm. okay has been that chefs really love that because it doesn't take up freezer space and doesn't require a cold chain. It slacks out easier, all the things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question for you, just to get the, to give you a bit of background, but my question for you is currently our retail product, which we sell through Amazon at farmer's markets and, and a few select retailers is in a glass jar. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in pursuing potentially moving towards an eco-friendly pouch. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your opinions on how one might go about sourcing that. So specifically, like who are the best salespeople for those types of machines? We own our production facility. It's in Southwest mm -hmm. Michigan as well. So okay. who are the best salespeople for machines and any specific recommendations you might have and as we're sourcing these pouches and how might we work with you? Yeah, well, definitely reach out to me. I can send you my contact information or we can get you my contact information. So you've got that and I can connect you to the right people here within EPAC um, that can help. Uh, I've got a couple of people I'd point you to on the machine side of it. Um, that's something I know very, very little about. So uh, I can't answer the machine side of it. Um, on the uh, sustainable side of pouches, um, I think that there's, there's a couple of considerations that I would have. Um, one that you just mentioned, the acidic piece of it. Um, so compostable uh, is not going to be your friend. Uh, it's not going to work well for your product, both because it's acidic. It doesn't do well with uh, a liquid type of product. Um, it will break down faster and you've got uh, vapor barriers uh, that it's just, it's just not going to work. Um, PCR. I'd have to look into. I don't remember for sure whether it would. I think that's going to be your best bet as far as that type of sustainable um, product. Um, the recyclable, I just personally don't like it uh, just because it, it feels like it's cheating uh, because we're just saying it's, it feels like it's greenwashing to me, honestly. Um, it's just, I, I'd like to be honest about it, that it just, yeah, I can, I can, if you really want a recyclable, we can sell you a recyclable. Um, it is recyclable, and uh, and if you take it and you, uh, you you mail it to the the right place, you can get it recycled. But you're going to spend more uh, carbon emissions to get it to that place than you're going to regain from what you you you've done to recycle it. So it just it just isn't worth it. It doesn't make sense. Um, I think that uh, the the other benefits, kind of exactly what I was saying before about uh, the glass jars, uh, is is some of the other elements of the supply chain that you have some of that that CO2 uh, savings that you're not shipping that heavy weight of a glass jar, um, both in the empty jar shipping, shipping it to a customer, shipping it to a consumer. If you're on Amazon, glass jars are, are, are difficult on, on Amazon. You've got a lot of breakage. Um, you've got uh, extra weight uh, that you're going to be paying for, which ultimately the customer ends up paying for, and there's more gas and everything that's used through that. And so, um, I mean, kind of the bottom line is, I think a lot of the benefit that you get is out of just the, the, the those types of benefits. And potentially the PCR would work. Um, I think you'd have to kind of look at what your acidity levels are, are at to see if that would be a, a viable option or not um, and kind of take it from there. I think that um, the other kind of comment that I'd make about it is it sounds like you're more of a premium product. Um, I do 
um, sometimes will recommend for people to put it in glass, especially if they're starting off, um, that, that you want to get it out there. But then as you move towards and you start to think about the supply chain and logistics piece of it, there are some options to say, you know what, we can do this in a, in a pouch and we can look really nice. I think that um, what, what you need to do to make sure it looks really nice is think about the material selection um, and think about your, your design. And so um, if you're not going to invest in a designer that, that knows what they're doing and have a really good design, then it may not be the best option. But if you do have that, you can still look like a premium product and take advantage of those other benefits of weight, uh, better weights, um, better um, other, other offsets that you have uh, due to using flexible over glass. Um, but I will, uh, let me just put in the chat, I'll send my email address here just so you've got that. And if you want to just send me an email, then I can connect you to the appropriate people, um, both in terms of kind of our salespeople that can talk through and give you all the details of, of that. And then I can also connect you to one of our, our guys that uh, knows, knows a lot of the machine stuff in the industry. Awesome. Uh, Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks for the question, Cody. All right. Next up, we have Sasha. Sasha, do you want to come on and ask your question? Sure. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Um, I got a quick question. So um, I own a company called Ann Ethel's Pot Pies. We manufacture frozen pot pies. Okay. And we use um, a plastic film seal in two different ways, one for the crust, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, one for the filling. There's no yep. just, just the <laughs> um shelf stable product so um my question is a lot of times we get um uh like icicles on the interior mm -hmm. and condensation is there any way of avoiding something like that yeah think about that is there like an anti-fog seal well by just not using the right or is it a thicker material? material that they need you said, is it, is it a, um, you said it's shelf stable. It's not frozen. Or it's no, frozen? no, no. This sample is shelf stable because it's just got potato sticks inside, but normally it has um, filling like it would in a normal pot pie. It is got, it, got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I think um, a lot of times in, um, in frozen, you have um, a, a, a greater vapor barrier um, permeability to it. So if you think about, um, if you look at uh, uh, frozen fruit that you get from the store, um, there's actually holes in it. They actually like, literally put holes in it intentionally in order to- In the bag? It, in the bag. So yeah, if you go if you go look at a bag of green- Like beans, microscopic holes that you don't see? Uh, you can you can actually see them. If you, if you go look at them, you, you, you'll see some lines with actual holes on it. And, and that, that is to intentionally allow for that vapor barrier to take place and, and that to um, that exchange to take place because you're in a frozen environment that, 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 that condensation that, 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 that comes in there. Because I mean, really through the supply chain, you have a little bit of this freeze thaw um, cycle, which you don't want it to happen, but there's always at least some level of that. And when that happens, you get some of that, that moisture and that condensation. Uh, that, that gathers and, and takes place. The way that the, their product is, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a physics thing that uh, uh, if it's in a, a cardboard is the other piece of it and the film is it's the, it's kind of the path of least resistance. And so that's where the moisture, the moisture gathers um, and there's nowhere for it to go. So it just co uh, kind of comes together right there. And then when it, it, it is back in a fully, uh, fully frozen environment, then that's when it re refreezes, and that's where you get like the icicles and things like that. And so, uh, my 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 first thought is to think about having a e either a higher permeability uh, layer in it, so you've got a little bit more of that oxygen exchange, so it's not quite as fully fully sealed um, on that. Um, I am a little bit hesitant uh, to, to to give my full recommendation for something like that because I am not a food scientist. I am not a um, that's not not my area of expertise. Um, but that's my first thing to consider is to look at all right. What are the options with using a different type of film? Maybe even having some sort of um, uh, uh, microscopic holes in it like they do with a with a frozen fruit or frozen vegetables. Um, I do I'm concerned about that from a food safety perspective because um, I, I don't know that I've seen that in a lot of things. If you think about like a frozen dinner, 
um, they'll often have a similar type of problem where you've got that moisture on there and it is a fully sealed uh, type of problem. Uh, it may be a problem that honestly, there might not be a great solution to um, because if you look at what, what they're doing, they're doing it like that. And uh, I suspect there's a reason for it. So I can, I can tell you why, I can tell you how to solve it, but there may be another problem that I'm not, uh, not aware of in the food safety uh, end of it that, uh, um, that I would suspect is there. So um, I think that uh, my, my thought is maybe you consider using uh, some more opacity to it so it's less visible. Um, if you think about a, uh, a very clear one, so like again, the frozen dinner example, you see it when it's right there, it's, it's right on the, uh, on the patch right there. But if you had something like, um, and I'm just thinking about some of like the oatmeal containers that, that I've seen that have like a printed label on it. When you peel, peel that off, you, you're not going to notice it because you're you're focused on the product. So from the consumer experience piece of it is they see the printed stuff on top and uh, it explains what the product is. Maybe there's some instructions on top. Maybe it's just branding. Uh, but they they look at that. They see that. They don't even notice that uh, there's condensation or or icicles underneath that. Once they peel it off, then it's off. They're focused on the product. Okay. So instead of solving this, you just cover it up. Uh, honestly, that might be the answer uh, because I, I'm just afraid that uh, the, the potential solves that uh, that I would think of for uh, from a materials perspective uh, might might get you into food safety uh, issues. That uh, uh, just kind of thinking about your type of product, I uh, I couldn't I honestly can't tell you why it's okay for fruit and vegetables and it's not okay for a frozen dinner uh, to do something like that. Uh, it could be a USDA requirement. It could be uh, FDA. Uh, requirement. If there's any meat in it, it falls under USDA uh, regulatory uh, sp spectrum. And, uh, and and I'm sure that there's some uh, reg regulations around that. Whereas when it's a, a, a fruit or vegetables, it's under FDA, which are different uh, requirements. Yeah, it's strange because when we um... When we stack them up in the freezer, only the top one shows the condensation. All the others, it doesn't affect. It's because you you got them all insulated. You got the top the one that's that's above it is insulating the one that's below it, and so yep. it's it's, it's kind of the heat rises, and so you've got that top layer is what's uh, what's insulating. Another option is to put something on top. So if you're just, I mean, this doesn't help at retail when you've got. Um, uh, them stacking it however they, they want to do it and however it goes through the supply chain. But if you've got some sort of insulation barrier, that's kind of what I would try is some ins insulative layer on that top one. Maybe it's just literally a piece of cardboard uh, that sits on top of that top layer. Um, I'd, I'd give that a try uh, and do some testing that way. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, the other question I had was, and I don't know if you can address this, was um, we're thinking about just doing food service, like grab and go. So mm -hmm. the product would go from frozen to obviously being slacked out in a refrigerated temperature. Do mm -hmm. you do anything with map packaging or do you know anything about that? I don't, that, that's not an area okay. I know much about, so. Okay, I'll retract it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'll tell you what I know, but uh, if I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna make something up and uh, pretend like I do. <laughs> Perfect, thanks so much, Sasha. All right, next question. I'd like to invite uh, Trishma up to ask your question on bakery products. Hello, I am the owner of Shug Shug. It's the only Virgin Islands bakery in the Boston area. Um, so I make Virgin Islands inspired bakery products such as tarts, um, which is like a pie um, and there are like nine inch shaped as well as mini cupcake shaped um, tarts and guava, coconut, and pineapple. Those are the traditional flavors. Um, currently, I am just selling online as well as like at farmer's markets and you know, direct to consumer. Great. I use a just a normal, well, I've used two different types of pie containers so one was like plastic um you can see through the product it's cool but um 
I like the box a little bit better. So it's like a white box and then I have, you can see the product on the top. So a window on the top. However, yep. with those boxes, they, they like if I'm stacking pies on top of each other, the boxes like mess up in shape or like if I have them in the fridge, yeah, like they break down. So I'm just trying to think of better or another way, I guess, to package those products. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, huh. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just, is, is kind of look, look at what competitors are doing, look what everyone else is doing and, and, and trying to find why it's not working for you. Um, so fle flexible packaging probably is not going to work super well for, uh, especially if it's not frozen. Um, I don't know if you said you were fresh or frozen. I think you're fresh, correct? Um, they're, they're fresh. However, I am playing with frozen as well. Okay. <laughs> in in yeah. fresh, uh, pie, pies doesn't really work all that well for flexible unless it's very small, um, kind of like a uh, yeah, like hand pie type of type of size yeah. um, does work well for that. For the larger sizes, I'd be be looking at um, kind of what what is it that's not working about the ones that you're using? Are you using a um, one that's supposed to be more uh, like a thinner grain of, uh, of cardboard um, compared to what competitors are using? If you look at some of the big brands, um, I was just looking at uh, like uh, what was that, Mrs. Smith's, and uh, what are some of the other ones uh, yeah. in the frozen yeah. section last night? Uh, I make a triple every year for Christmas or Thanksgiving, so I need I need all the different pies, um, and uh, and 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 they use a, a cardboard uh, box that that does have that rigidity that's yeah. able to support uh, each of it. When you've got that plastic window in there, you lose some of the structure to the box, and so you you'll get some bowing um, in that both because of the plastic, but you're also not getting that connection. Um, when you think about like a truss or something like that, um, that, that connects one side to the other, going back to my engineering uh, architecture days, but uh, you have a, um, a connection which strengthens the rigidity of the, the unit. Mm -hmm. And by adding that, uh, that window in there, you, you lose that connection and it just kind of, and it, and it folds and it falls apart right. there. And so um that's that's one thing to consider is all right how is that the other thing to look at is like where where is that hole is that hole and that going around the corner of it you're going to lose even more um rigidity yeah. in there it than it does. it does and that's what yeah. i was kind of assuming based on your description um and if you you, you can find another uh unit that has it in the center of the box, you still retain your corner structure and your your walls of it, which will make it more more rigid and more able to stack. Um, I'm guessing that there's probably a kind of a limit to how high you could stack those um, with the current ones before you start getting it to kind of get yeah, in and a little like peeking <laughs> in there. Yeah. Um, and so it's just kind of a, it's a, I don't know if you've seen uh, different places that say like, don't, uh, do not stack more than three, three cases high. Um, it's probably the same thing, or it's do not stack more than two, two pies high, three pies high, uh, yeah. before you start getting that, uh, kind of the breakdown of the structure. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I do, uh, in your case would say, look at what the competitors are doing. Um, look at what the big players in the industry are doing and then see what you can do to take a spin on that. Because if you just take what Mrs. Smith's pie is doing and you put it in a box, just like they are, then you lose some of the, the magic that you have and you don't want right. to do that. And so yeah, exactly. what are the things that you can do to, to, to look at it and think about how they're doing it and say, all right, all right, let's feel this. How thick, how thick does this feel? They've had engineers, packaging engineers that have been gone to school for years and years that came, came to say, all right, this is the ideal structure that both uh, accounts for uh, weight. So it's, it's the least amount of weight, the least amount of material we need in order to make it um, uh, function as we need it to which is to be able to stack high, to be able to uh, maintain the inks, to be able to maintain the products. And so um, I look at that as kind of a, uh, kind of use the, uh, uh, the the things that everyone else is doing uh, to in their expertise, and then and then see what you can do to, to make your spin on that and make it a little bit different. All right. Okay. And do you guys do that type of packaging at Input. We do not. Yeah, okay. no, we only do flexible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I want to uh, reiterate, Jeff, is when 
you know, I was running my business T-Squares, we took an energy bar essentially and broke them up into little pieces and put them in a multi-serve pouch, which I thought was innovative at the time. Um, and it was different, but it actually created a barrier for customers to understand what we were um, yep. because it like looked so different and it actually made our sales like less or lower and, 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 e and decrease the efficiency. Um, and so what I would just recommend is like, yeah, as you mentioned, understand what the competitors are doing in a similar type of situation, if it's fresh or in the frozen section or like wherever it is, um, to understand how you can do something similar because, you know, your pies are the things that you want to stand out, not necessarily spending lots of money or figuring out some unique packaging. It isn't the reason people are buying you. Right. All right, perfect. Thanks so much for your question. Um, next up, we have Chef Latoya. Would you like to come and ask your question? Good afternoon. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So my name is uh, Chef Latoya Larkin. I am the owner of Black Girl Tamales. We do fusion tamales. So uh, I went to a summit, uh, the Frozen Food Summit with Walmart last month. Um, they were very interested in carrying the product. They have they have started a new um, frozen food concept uh, with chef inspired dishes. So they said they're getting away or they're doing away with a lot of the old stuff and bringing in a lot of new innovative ideas. So currently my package is like this. So I yep. uh, put a label on it, but they were um, advising that for it to stand out <clears throat> and to be in the um, actual section with the chef, with the other chef inspired dishes to do like a box. Or I was actually thinking, do you think that this could stand in a pouch, like to just kind of slide it in? Because right now this is boiling the bag or you can put them in a the microwave. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that would be a viable option, if not the box? Uh, I think that the, the, the issue that you're going to have with, with standing up uh, in, in the format you have right now is the um, uh, your balance. So it, it would be very tall and it's, right. it's going to fall down. And so okay. you'd have to you'd have to structure it a little bit differently. So you, maybe you have a, a larger gusset um, on the bottom of the bag. So the gusset is you have one one sample here. So um, when you've got a stand up pouch like this, this is mm -hmm. our holiday pouch that uh, you're going to see a uh, there's a gusset on the bottom, which is where it stands out. And so if yes. you widened it and then you you put them in there, so it looked like was it six tamales stacked yes, straight? A, uh, a flat pack. Flat yeah, pack. And so I don't know if it's possible to do two and two. So you'd, okay. you'd have only three stack three high and then two mm -hmm. at the bottom. So it, it lowers the center of gravity um, okay. would, would allow it to stand. Um, I think you're going to have problems with it standing up uh, the way you have it um, because your okay. center of gravity is too high and your base is mm -hmm. too small. And so you're okay. going you're gonna to tip. Um, you okay. could do it in a uh, like a display, display box where you've got like a cardboard box. And then you, you stack them kind of one after the other. Um, and then you get them to stand up like that. Once you get a good amount of the product that people have taken off the shelf, you start <laughs> getting down to kind of halfway down, then stuff starts falling down um, and it right. doesn't stand quite as well. And so I think that if you had a way to, to restack it, so it was two and two and you were only three high, lower center <laughs> gravity, you're going to have a much better chance of it, it standing correctly. Okay. Okay, I'll ask uh, my manufacturers if they could do it that way instead of stack them two instead of the other one. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that I like about I mean, with the pouch um, is that you get a, you get a lot of real estate on it that way. You you get a lot of space that you can you can advertise your product uh, on it there. Okay. And when you're standing up like that, you can see a lot of it. Um, but box, I mean, box is a similar type of thing um, that you can have a box that uh, stands up straight. Um, Pouch. I think you often will get more, um, more, more uh, horizontal real estate um, mm -hmm. that way, just because of the way that it, uh, the way that it stands. Um, boxes sometimes they'll even turn them sideways, and so you, you lose your your real estate that way. Now I do have one other question. Cost wise, how do you? What do you? Uh, what what would, be, what would I be looking at cost wise? Like the difference in the costing from doing a pouch versus the box. Um, for a pouch, kind of what you're describing. It, it, lots of variables and so this could be it could range um but i mean it could be anywhere from any quantities things like that i i kind of put it somewhere around 20 to 45 cents uh per per pouch um somewhere in that range but uh, 
that, that's a very, very rough estimate. <laughs> it could even be more or less than that, but uh, okay. I, I'm pretty confident it would be somewhere in that range. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. And also I would ask with your manufacturer, like what capabilities they have, you know, how they're set up, if they're set up more so for boxing or pouching or yep. either or to make sure that it's, um, you understand what their limitations are. Okay. Right. That's so even right. though like, That's right yeah, some frozen products I've seen like that will have a core, a core or a box, uh, a chipboard box, and then like a plastic inside essentially in case there's any melting mm -hmm. that you don't want the box to get wet and that kind of ruins it um so then you almost have to have like two yeah. sets of packaging versus if you just do a pouch it's the the form and the moisture barrier as well yeah that, that's the thing with a pouch is that you don't have to have that bag that it's in right now you just literally put your product directly into the pouch and so it's one one bag instead of like like you were saying during the, the box okay okay yeah, okay. okay, great. Thank you. So, yeah, I would not do it, do it that separate. And so you, you'd want to change your instructions. You likely wouldn't be able to boil it in the bag. Uh, right. So you would just be a microwave, uh, microwave okay. type of product. Okay. All right, perfect. So we are coming up at the end of our time here. I want to thank everyone for your questions. These are really great today. Um, Jeff, any final thoughts that our, our guests should consider um, with going with flexible that uh, you mean like top questions that you get asked all the time that we haven't talked about yet? I mean, the biggest thing that I've touched a little bit on it is, is, is using the right material and, and understanding what the materials are um, that, that your product uh, requires. Um, one of the big things uh, that you run into with, with flexible is that um, it's 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 complicated. Uh, it's a lot harder than you you would would have thought it was before I got into the uh, the industry. Uh, I was more on the the design side, uh, but since being at EPAC, I've learned that uh, it's significantly more complex than I initially um, uh, realized that it was in terms of the different barrier layers and how do you match this layer with this layer. Uh, things like the moisture barrier exchange uh, properties that you have to take into consideration are all things that you don't really um, always consider um, or think about as you're going into it. You, you think, uh, I want a thin bag or I want a thin plastic. I want a thick plastic. I want a see-through or I want a and not see-through. I want a metal one. Like you think like, okay, that's all the options, but there's literally thousands and thousands of permutations and options there are. And each one with that comes with a different uh, uh, property that may impact the, uh, the quality of your product. And so very important to, to know, understand, and, uh, and have a good partner that can explain it to you so that uh, they can help you walk through that process. Perfect. Love that, Jeff, and definitely big, uh, good advice there. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. And as I mentioned, I'll be sharing a recording from today's session if it will be helpful in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks so much and have a great end of your week. Thank you, everyone.